This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Welcome back to Shake Them Ropes. My name is Chris Novembrino. Joining me, as always, is Jeff Hawkins. Jeff, later on in the show, this is what they call in the business, a dramatic tease. I have an announcement that is going to rock your world. But in the interim, Jeff, how are you? <laughs> oh, I, oh, man, I hope it's, it's not something I know. <laughs> well, it's not gonna. It's not you. It's yeah. It's more the audience. I know. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Got that, you gotta think. Think about who the you is. In, in the Finally, context of Chris any is sentence. pop. Chris is popping the question. I've been waiting so long for this. I'm finally getting a ring on my finger. I'm gonna be an honest woman. The, that might be what's <laughs> happening later on in the show. There's only one way to find out. It's right here on the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Shake Them Ropes is the show. Chris Novembrino is the host. Jeff Hawkins is also the host. Hi, Jeff. Hi. I'm just I'm heating it up. I'm, I'm building this thing. You know, I, I feel like there's not enough old school building in shows anymore. Especially There's for your not own any old school building in any shows, and this is actually something, it's odd that you fell into this, because this was the crux of my wrestling thinking overnight, it is just, I'm thinking about this World's Collide show, and I thought about Blackpool, and it's, it's, there's no build anymore, there's no, it's just, there's gonna be a match We got to find a reason to get people's interest in it for two weeks, and then we're just going to move on. And there's no hate built. There's no there's no twist and turns in the story as we get there. And this is the product of having not just weekly shows, but weekly shows that are building to monthly pay-per-views where you have like, like this Asuka Becky Lynch story could could we could drag that out for another four months. It could be and awesome. Get to mania. Like that was a really and, fun interaction, but I have absolutely no faith that this is of any consequence or is worth hanging on to. The Rhea Ripley Tony Storm match at Warden Worlds Collide could be something you really, really build up, and it's just going to be there. And instead, we're going to or is it Bianca? No, Bianca Belair and and uh, Rhea are going to be at uh, at Portland. That's the other thing is they're building two cards simultaneously. And, and neither of them feel important just yet. But yeah, no, let me let me go to one thing in that Becky segment. If you're going to make this a cartoon, Kyrie saying doing the I'm sneaking up on you big steps behind Jerry Lawler. I howled. I died at that. I just it was so unrepentantly stupid. It cracked me up. I enjoy Kyrie and Oscar's acting in the ring but i couldn't necessarily call it a character at this point you know what i mean right. like, like what they're doing <laughs> is good the blocking is good oscar could wrestle a paper bag and it'd be entertaining and ditto with Kyrie sane i think that she's got good comedic timing in the same way that oscar does and it contrasts against the actual in-ring talent in a really interesting and novel way but they're doing really boring things with them yeah, right the, down the, to this, the name of the Kabuki Warriors. How uninspired! I, mean, I I just don't believe that Becky has gone on this internal journey of of you know man can I, of self doubt about Asuka. I just I just don't. I I like because the there was promo. no sign of this internal journey three weeks exactly. ago. Exactly, exactly. It, it, it's a it's a forced story to to get there, and I think I think Becky has done good with what she's had. I prefer her in more yellow than black if she's going to do the Bruce Lee motif thing. Um, I think that helps. I think it helps brighten up her, her, not just her character, but her entire look. It looks better to me as a baby face when she's dressed brightly instead of darkly. Because when she was dark, it was the, it was the heel. That was during that whole time when she was the man when they were trying to turn her heel and it wasn't taking. So it, it it's one of those things, and I think you know I think she's she's giving the promo she needs to give. It just doesn't feel like 
it, it just doesn't feel like it's earned right right now. That's and, honestly and- a big problem across the board with everything on WWE's main roster. But you're even getting some of that not earned vibe going on in the NXT universe as well. But it, yeah. it's really, really prevalent in the main roster. Well, you don't invest in anything because you're not convinced that this Oscar Becky feud is going to be relevant to anything at all two months from now. I really wish they hadn't overused the mist, too. I, I got to be honest with you. I think that's also, I mean, it's like every time, you know, Asuka the mist. should have a bag of tricks, one of which is the mist. But yes. her and Kyrie should be defined by their devious, dastardly and clever tricks rather than this trope this japanese trope no less of the mist like i'll give you, i'll give you an example back on your nxt i really liked the beatdown of keith lee i thought that was great i think it was very it felt very 1986 87 yeah yeah you know you know four guys on one we're going to break his leg so that he's out for a while Keith Lee was kind of calling down the thunder on himself, so it was yeah. like a combination of brave and a little bit inviting inviting the challenge. Like, no, I loved the vibe that was going on in the early part of this week's NXT US show, particularly now the here, Undisputed Era. Now, here's the issue, though. A broken ankle like that should take you out for a number of weeks. You build up your return. You build up how, you know. It should affect is, matches that you're working for several weeks so that you're he, working at 80 to 85%. And we, the fans of you, the baby face, are just wishing that you would just take a couple more weeks off and get that ankle back to 100%. But it well, also just, gives you a different match style to work for several weeks. Well, well, not just that. He shouldn't even be working. They should be checking in with him. How are you doing? How's your rehab? You know, and he should just be spitting fire. When I get back, I'm going to kill the Undisputed Era. And then the next okay. phase is you come back too soon because you're a baby face and you just love to compete, Jeff. You just you want to be back in the ring. Well, not only, well, you take all this this knowledge that we have of angles and how they work. Not an hour later, Keith Lee is running across a parking lot doing doing the Marquise Corvone pounce. <laughs> on Roderick Strong through a shrubbery. Okay, yes. that, that you know, it's it's like the the injuries because of the WWE and, and mantra. It was perfectly framed too, so as to lend itself to being a meme or a gif. Yeah, and and the WWE mantra is stars don't get hurt, they don't get injured in reality, unless it's going to be for that one match where they're going to lose. And I think that's probably what they're going to do with Keith Lee, but it's like, you know, put people out for weeks. Do I mean, go, we don't need to see everybody every week. We can see story develop. And the problem is there's so many pay-per-views that we're building towards that we don't build toward them. We, we, we Ed Wood it. We go, okay, here's the story. Here's the match. Here's why they're fighting. Okay. Here's the big blow off. Let's move on. They did that with Rusev and Lashley as well. It, it's like, it, it it just feels like they they need this stuff to simmer a little bit more. They have the stove on hot when the stove should be building heat on a four to a boil, and then you're not scalding everything. Yeah, and uh, strategic usage of the lid uh, rather than just turning up the heat underneath. You know, let, yes. let time doing some of the work here. Now, there's yeah, a the metaphor just- there that I think is very serviceable. Also, I've been doing a lot of cooking recently. So was I. I was cooking this morning. So <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm really, I'm very much on my joy of cooking bullshit these days, Hawkins. I've I've learned my lesson about how to properly saute onions, and I can't be in a hurry to do it. So it's one of those things where it's like, no, you put it on low and you let the heat build, and then you put them in, and then then you just let them sit there for a while, and you brown, dummy. I know you're hungry. But yeah, okay. <laughs> no, no, but I think that there's a point here. Like we'll often throw out angle alternatives and it's not as though you and I are doing profound creative writing here mostly we're just referencing wrestling angles that you and I saw as kids and saying why not port these fairly obvious angles onto this story that you guys seem to be telling instead of doing the weird thing let's get into this match here with uh Pete Dunn and Matt Riddle versus Flash Morgan Webster and Mark Andrews 
you'd almost forget that Flash Morgan Webster and Mark Andrews were ever tag team champions on NXT UK. They certainly didn't have any heft, and it felt like this audience had absolutely no clue of that. And Matt Riddle and Pete Dunne came out, had a match. I thought this was a good match. I I thought that this was a fun match. I think we're on track with that story. But the synergy between Riddle and Dunne is good. And the crowd is immediately bought into the Broserweights as like this instant fan favorite, which I think will make the betrayal really good. Uh, I am not sold on the betrayal now. Oh, you think it's going to stick? I think it's going to stick for a while. I I don't, I I think it's going to come later than sooner. Um, I enjoyed this a lot. I agree with you. I, if, if they had built up any NXT UK guys as being something, or at least even giving us two weeks of profiles on them as to why we should care about them, that this match would be, this match would be memorable. This match would be as, as the flagship puts it, a notebook match. For me, I I really loved this. I would Especially, even turn Mark Andrews and Flash Morgan Webster, if if not for this match, even longer term. Like I I would have used this as a springboarding point where they get desperate and try to do kind of ruthless things to win this match because it gives Matt Riddle and Pete Dunne an initial challenge. Mark Andrews and Flash Morgan Webster, if they're going to stay a tag team, they need a fresh coat of paint. Um, and especially in NXT. U.S., I, they're never going to be treated as top-of-the-card babyface tag team, but I think they might actually have some interesting mileage as heels. I definitely liked this more than the tag team ladder match on, on Blackpool, which we'll go into a little bit once we get past, I think, the NXT U.S. show. Because, I, I, I mean, but you have to give it up for those two because they were the ones taking the most hellacious bumps on Saturday or Sunday, and here they are on Wednesday after a cross-ocean flight doing a match like this with no noticeable jet lag. I thought, you know, I, I thought that was great, but again, if I don't buy that Webster and Andrews are going to actually win this match in any way, if I don't, if I don't lower my doubt and skepticism in any way, that then I'm not I'm, in the match. Then I'm not in the match. Yeah. I'm just kind of like, yeah, these are nice spots. These are nice flips. These are nice aerial maneuvers. Um, But yeah, they gave them a lot of offense. I mean, I, I thought it was a great, great match. I really did. It's probably going to be one of my favorite tag team matches once we get to the end of the year, to be honest with you. But uh, I mean, both these matches, tag team matches were great, I thought. Yeah, I think that... Um, this match was super well worked. I liked that it wasn't it wasn't trying too hard to hit the spots. You know what I mean? Like they didn't overbook it, they didn't overblock it backstage, and so you didn't have as many of those coordinated spots. See, the bell even agrees with me here. So, um, all right, let's go on to the next topic here of the Grizzled Young Veterans versus Kushida and Alex Shelley. I gotta tell you, Alex Shelley, I, I get pairing him with Kushida again. But for this NXT audience, that must have been a who's that moment for them. I howled when Zach Gibson cut the promo afterwards where you're just trying to endear yourself to a bunch of hipsters who don't even know who you are. (laughs) He's amazing. Zach Gibson, (laughs) I, I mean, I've definitely, in the course of doing this show, went from going, like, why is this guy being featured in the UK tournament to why isn't this guy the singular feature of NXT UK every day, to why is this guy over on NXT US? Because this guy is a great promo. He is one of the great promos of his generation. This guy, he can make everyone hate him so fast. It's awesome. When I watched, yeah, me too. I've done a complete 180 on the guy. Because when I watched that UK tournament uh, the second year, and he's the guy that they're focusing on. I'm just like, all right, he's a guy with an okay body, not a great look. He's not particularly he a, photogenic. He has a little bit in the talking area, but I'm not seeing it right now. I know I had seen him probably on a progress show or two, and I'm just kind of watching. I'm going, this is obviously they're trying to make something of this guy so that it's not going to be such a horrible thing when the guy that they want to win, and I've 
I want to say it was Jordan Devlin as a baby face at the time because the because of the uh, because of the Finn Balor connection, but I forgot who they're pushing as the super baby face in that tournament. It might have actually been Tyler. I think Bate. it was Tyler Bate versus Zach Gibson in that tournament. That might be. Yeah, it, it was. But but. but but you're watching that and you go, okay, Gibson's obviously an afterthought that they're trying to give something to here. Now I watch and I go, Devlin and Gibson are the two best things on this show. And I just, I was like, God, let him cut a promo before the match and get this crowd fired up to watch this thing and it'll be hot as hell. Instead, they did afterwards, and I'm fine with it, but I was shocked as hell that they're going, they're making this big deal of Alex Shelley. Alex Shelley, Alex Shelley. Oh, he teamed with Kushida. Oh, he was he was the New Japan Junior Tag Team champs with 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 um with Kushida, and they got beat by Fish and O'Reilly in Japan. Okay, obvious rematch coming. And it was clever of them to make to beat him, but it's just shocking to me that I you know, now I have to care about Alex Shelley, even though he's in for a temporary run and they beat him on the first night. Okay. Interesting, interesting strategy. Yeah. I liked the bait and switch. I mean, the one thing you could say about this is you didn't know who was going to win. So you're able to be more invested in the match. And I, I definitely had that experience, even though when I'm like thinking about it, very obviously, the previous match here with Webster and Andrews was the better of the two matches. I found myself more mentally invested in the narrative of this one because I didn't see, I didn't necessarily see the beat coming for uh, Kushida and Alex Shelley. It, Neither did yeah. I. I watched that and my I immediately went to the edge of my couch. I went, "Oh, this is it. now. Now you have my attention." You know, I, I thought James Drake was quite good in this, and he was also. He, he's the most underappreciated part of that ladder match, especially especially with Gibson yelling at him and trying to get him on his shoulders. They said, I, I thought Drake... He is a I, very, I, very I, funny second banana, and he is yes. very invested in being the good second banana. And that's it all. And I think you have a good, I think you have a good read on, on what's going to happen with these two eventually. But the ride is fun right now. The ride is fun where he's he's the flunky and he doesn't know he's the flunky. He thinks he's an even member of the team right absolutely. now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. But yeah, no, that he never gets the stick time for a reason. Isaiah Swerve Scott defeats Tyler Breeze and Leo Rush. And this is a good match as well. There's a lot of good wrestling on this show for sure. Um, but this was a little light on the story for me. Like, you know, Tyler Breeze, since they brought him back... I, People are doing the perfunctory breeze is gorgeous thing, but he does feel very cold compared to you know where he was you know, five six years ago. Obviously, a different time, but just different time. It really feels like. And Leo Rush, man, I, I just I hate having him in these multi man matches because I think it's taken away from whatever the Leo Rush story was that we're trying to tell. And then we get to Angel Garza on commentary. <laughs> oh. You have a thought on that, do you? Um, they should do that less. <laughs> um, yeah, I think Would you like me to do to the get... rest of the show as Angel Garza where I would well, just I almost laugh it I thought about... <laughs> Yeah, I thought about doing this show as a WWE apologist and just going all in on that and saying, "Well, that was, you know what? That was really great and they have their finger on the pulse of the fans, Chris." I mean, they They've really knocked it out of the park this time. I, I think the wrestling industry has changed because of Vince McMahon's ideas here. But no, I, I, I agree. Do this Andrew I, uh, Garza style. Ha, ha, ha. The fans. Yes. <laughs> it was almost Jeff Goldblum-esque. Where he's like laughing. He's he, laughing no, at he the was, wrong he's, parts. He's laughing in like weird detached moments and you're not sure if he's hearing a joke in his head. It's like, here's the pin. Ha, 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 ha. Wait, what? <laughs> what are you doing over there? I don't know. I just I thought of this one time I was in this village and I, I came up to a child who was playing with a flute and I just I just laughed at the thought. Have you ever thought about if a tree befriended a dandelion? <laughs> 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 now I want Jeff Goldblum on commentary on <laughs> This is what I want Angel Garza's new gimmick to be. Um, yeah, I think they're just gonna get new quote unquote people in the mix here, but I agree. I, I don't, 
how are we supposed to feel about Leo Rush right now? How am I supposed to feel about Angel Garza? Like they did, they they're moving these people, but they're not actually telling us the stories to get us emotionally there with the move. Yeah, it's it's exposition. You know, last week he fought so and so, and this week he's here in the ring with this guy. Okay, uh, is is there any is there any? Uh, I mean, does he hate this guy more? Does he have certain animosity towards this person more? Is he? Nah, they're just going to do these flips and we're going to be excited and you should call it a good match. Yeah, like, why do I care that Isaiah Swerve Scott won this match? Like, why was I invested in seeing Swerve win versus Breeze or Leo Rush? Because then you'll be able to see him next week or in two weeks at when Worlds Collide where they'll tell you he, he, he's really confident. Yeah, Swerve, that's, Swerve, all that's what it actually Swerve means. It means confidence. It means believing in yourself and being an individual. <laughs> and Beth, Beth, what do you like most about Swerve Scott? I like his confidence. It's like, Mike, you're not telling me anything that I don't already know. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> she does say it louder. <laughs> <laughs> it was just such a. I remember almost throwing my remote at my television when, when I heard that. It was like, Beth, what do you like most, of, most about Swerve Scott? I like his confidence. I'm like, that's his entire gimmick. You're not saying anything. You're, you're Highlight just a move. Me words. Highlight something about his style that makes him unique and not his fashion style, but his wrestling style. I thought Leo Rush was really good in this match. Yeah, no, I he's be great. He's you. awesome, dude. Like, he's really, really good. Some of the counters, the, 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 that last counter where he did the, uh, b- like, the bottom rope stunner is always a winner with me. That sequence doesn't matter with when him he and Swerve on the outside where, like, they're hopping yeah. from the apron in and out. I mean, like, they're both they're both great wrestlers, man. And I, I really like Leo Rush. I, I think he's going to continue to be deeply underutilized here. But it's, it's a damn shame because... What he does with his size is he actually utilizes his size. Like a big guy simply could not move in those tight and narrow ways that Leo Rush is able to do. And I I think that it makes his match style and his wrestling style really visually different. And so we have two people in for when worlds collide from the U S side and we'll have uh, two people in from the NXT UK side. It's fairly obvious to me who the choices are going to be in that match. Joseph Connors uh, and Leguero. Oh, I'm going to hurt you. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. Um, I'm, I haven't seen the spoilers yet, but I'm guessing it's got, probably going to be like Devlin and Travis Banks. I, that, I mean that, that yeah, that's, yeah, that makes sense. That, really that, those are, I mean, they're not going to put in Leguero because people won't care about Leguero. Which is, <laughs> I mean, that's exactly that. why they might put in Legero so that he can yeah. eat the pin. That's true. I was saying about that. It's a definite possibility. We know Legero will be in one of the qualifying matches, though. Oh, absolutely. So absolutely. he's all, yeah. ever a contender. Might be him and Travis Banks again. <laughs> no, one can only hope. Uh, we may have a new two hundred five live ch- or cruiserweight champion sooner than later because Kalisto has resigned for five years. Fascinating. Which, it was last month, wasn't it, where Metalik was complaining, and then and then uh, Kalista was like, "Yeah, I'm right behind you, dude." And then all of a sudden, we're gonna throw money at the guy, kind of like we did Oni Lorkin. And I, I'm under the assumption it's gonna be one of these. I'm very happy with the money right now, but in about a month or two, or maybe a year, I'm gonna regret having not gone away. You know, I just think. Long term, though, for these guys, particularly Kalisto looking at a five-year deal. Did he want to go over to AEW? What was he going to do over at AEW? I mean, he'd be further up the card in AEW. But what does that mean in the context of AEW? The, the, the question is whether or not you want to... If you think you can become a star outside of WWE, or if you're happy going from town to town, staying in shape, staying in hotels, getting your airline miles, making very good money, probably eating a pin to a guy like Rowan every other week. And, you know, and that that's your life and you're just there to take care of your family. I can see that too. I, I, 
if I were in my twenties, I probably wouldn't be happy. No, no, because you'd want to be in my thirties. Str- yeah, I'd be your fine. late thirties. Yeah, dude. I I don't know. I I guess I I'm closer to that now, obviously, and I would do the main event circuit. You know, the WWE C shows, house shows, circuit, and. That seems like quality work. You get to wrestle in a clean, well-lit ring. And, you know, you get to work the WWE style, which is not nearly as physically demanding as AEW or Ring of Honor or New Japan. And if you're not trying to make art in between the ropes, that honestly seems like a totally viable way to make a little bit of money doing your wrestling thing. Okay, let's finish up this NXT show. Bianca Belair wins the number one contenders battle royal. I thought that this was good. I, I was not like begging and jonesing for a battle royal here, but in all fairness to this battle royal, more entertaining than I expected. I liked the little bucking of expectations with Shotzi Blackheart where she disappeared outside of the ring, comes back in late in the match, and you're like, oh my gosh, she's not actually going to win, and then she doesn't win. But I like that that set up a feud with her and Mia Yim. Good usage of that. Uh, what do you think about Casey Cat and Nazaro making a return here? Um, happy she's back, but I just you know I <laughs> I think she'd probably be happier going on to American Ninja Warrior, being a coach or something for kids on their kids version or something to that effect. I'm 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 low on what they're going to do with her in the WWE. I, I think she's good for a few spots here and there. I just, I don't see them making a run with her. I, I think they used her celebrity. She's now there and, and they're always going to find a reason not to use her. She's too short. She's too slight. She gets injured all the time. It, it's, it, I, I just, I like her a lot. It's, it's nothing against her. I just, I don't trust the company. So I don't know why you'd come back if you initially said this isn't for me. Yeah, it's true. It's true. And you look at the way that they're doing pushes in this division right now, and it's going to be very tricky for Casey Catanazaro if you're looking to lay land. Like, Rhea Ripley is your champion. She's going to be the champion for the foreseeable future. So either one would... I dis- I just liked the Shotzi Blackheart thing, by the way. You disliked it? I don't... I disliked everything after the Shayna thing. I, I, after eliminating Shayna, she should have the celebration part where she just ends up looking like a moron because she gets thrown out right afterwards. Oh, well, she didn't deserve Either, to win the. You know what I mean? Like, I, it, no, it had no, to be I didn't. Such no, no, no. That, don't yeah. get me wrong. That's the time when you do the thing where Shayna gets so mad that she pulls out Shotzi. Okay, that's the time I agree you with do that. that. Yeah, especially when you in, you're introing somebody that nobody really knows. Oh, that's Shotzi Blackheart. Oh, I need to pay attention to her. And instead, she's howling like a wolf, and Mia Yim just dumps her, and you're just like, or B- was it Bianca that dumped It was Bianca her? who dumped like- her. And, and, and I guess my big problem with Bianca <laughs> is she never got comeuppance for clearly positioning herself in a disadvantageous place. Like, you over and again, she put herself in the worst field position and never paid yeah. the price for it. And I just kind of, I was waiting for her to get, you know, hoisted by her own petard over the ring. No, but I I like this feud with with Rhea. I think the two of them. Yes, I, that's I a like match that. I want. Yes, that's yes. a match I want. And I want ruthless I mean, Bianca Belair really yes. taking it to Rhea Ripley, whipping her with the hair because that spot hasn't been used in a while, other than the War Games. Um, <clears throat> I want I want this EST character fleshed out a little bit more in between when worlds collide and that. Um, and you got to put her on maybe, kind of a hot streak. Like Bianca needs yeah. to come into this match getting wins, strong wins, arrogant wins, dominant yeah. wins. Definitely. Yeah. I agree with you. Um, you have now seen the now Robert Strauss or Robert Stone. That's yes, the Robert, Robert Stone, Stone brand. Brand with uh, Chelsea Green. Any thoughts? I mean, he's not really giving me any strong characterization vibes at this point other than True. generic guy who wears sunglasses and suit manager. You know what I mean? He's just and, Hollywood and, agent. And, Chelsea, and Chelsea's hot. Yeah, that, right. Yeah, no. <laughs> It'll be interesting when they put a little more meat on the bones, but, like, I get it. He's a manager agent type, but they have him at, like, default flavor of manager agent type right now. 
A couple things from the main roster before we get into NXT UK slash AEW talk. Um, the Miz is going to be, right after they turn him heel, signs a deal to host a game show called Cannonball on the USA Network. Um, of particular interest to me, the uh, the sideline reporter is a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine. I won't say very good now, but he used to be a very good friend of mine by the name of Simon Gibson. I used to mentor him in stand-up a little bit. Um, he has since hustled and grinded his way. Uh, he made Montreal just for laughs last year or two years ago, and they taped it for an Amazon show. Very funny kid. Hope hope this show takes off for him because um, he, he's such a nice guy. He was really, when I was making my comeback, quote unquote, in 2011, uh, before things fell apart in my life, I did, I did on a lark. I did a, I did a stand-up class and there were, there were four of us in there and he and I bonded a lot on comedy theory and, uh, and writing and stuff like that. So I hope, I hope the best for him. And then on raw, buddy Murphy has now joined the Monday night Messiah and the AOP to be a stable. Oh my God. This is so transparently a ripoff of Chris Jericho's inner circle. Only with better casting, less good top of the card, better supporting cast. How so? Do you think Buddy Murphy's not really a part of it? I think, I no, I think he's like the Sammy Guevara. You've got the tag team, and you've got the uh, young up-and-comer guy who's being mentored by Seth Rollins. <clears throat> See, here, here's where I go, is because my WWE cynicism is so high, I'm already looking at, okay, which one's turning heel on which? because <laughs> it's not going to last that long. Uh, like, I think eventually they'll get frustrated with Buddy Murphy. Maybe he disappoints them and they go with a baby yeah. face push for Buddy Murphy off of this. But I think this is good for him. Oh, if yeah. They, if, they, if they can sustain it for a while and really make it something. And instead, I mean, I think, I think Monday Night Messiah is, is stupid. I got to be honest with you. I don't like it. Um, I, I think it's a little... It's a little too over the top. Well, it's unearned. In terms of... Like, what has he done to even make the affirmative case for himself as the Messiah in this case? Well, yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying it, like, in, like, biblical terms. I, you know, like, how has he But that's how the marketing Raw? is on, on, on the on the T-shirts and stuff. He has, like, a stained glass picture of himself as, like, Jesus, except it's the Monday Night Messiah. And I just go, well, that's... Uh, that's tacky as hell. Yeah, right. I, I, I just if if he had done something to quote unquote save Raw yeah. in the narrative, like I I I don't know what that would be. Like the during Survivor Series, something substantial was on the line for Raw. Like they would maybe lose the Universal Championship, so they'd have no top of the card title, and they'd only have the IC belt, and he'd saved the Universal title for the brand or whatever. Then at that point, like he has a argument not a great argument but an argument that he saved the brand if you will uh, but in this case he's just started calling himself the messiah because heels give themselves a ridiculous title yeah pretty much although the real messiah for me kevin owens running up the skateboard ramp of raw and doing a flip onto the aop and then basically cracking his head i think on the concrete that that was did you did you see that spot i did not see that spot Okay, they're doing a fist fight, which is ridiculous because they're using wrestling moves in a fist fight because we we can't maintain rules or whatever. But uh, they're out by they're out by the announce table, um, the AOP and Joe are, and Kevin Owens goes running up the ramp, and then as you get to the platform where the ramp is, there's that kind of curvature there. He runs up there and does a somersault onto the AOP. It, it's quite good and. Uh, Kevin Owens remains. Kevin and Joe, they're awesome. Yeah, are awesome. But those guys, yeah. those guys would be awesome in any company in any division doing whatever. Those guys are great. Speaking of any company, AEW has won the week again against uh, NXT by about two hundred thirty thousand viewers. And TNT has announced, or Turner has announced that AEW will be getting a second show. It will be a more expanded version of what Dark is. Uh, date or day and time are unknown as of yet. This is fascinating to me because I still don't think AEW has proven themselves on, on TNT yet. 
No, I, I, I mean, would they, agree. I mean, if you look at the – they've stabilized, right? You look at the you know numbers over three very, months here, four months here. They've stabilized, but they stabilized at a low. They had an initial – They're very good for wrestling, good, yes. which is a low bar. Right, right yeah. Very, very good for wrestling is, yeah, the tallest short kid. Yeah, I'm uh... – I'm fascinated by this. I, I am under the impression that they should they should just do a, a second show that's completely separate from from the Dynamite universe, even so far as maybe even giving the show to MLW and their crew. You know what they should do? Like the old style WWF interview format show because they they're already 605 well yeah like uh what vince used to do with bobby heenan where they you know they'd be like at a commentary desk and maybe showing some clips but also doing interviews with wrestlers and that sort of thing because it seems to me that kenny and the bucks and all of those guys they want to be doing more of a tv products thing anyways like you know being the elite is more of a show than it is about like wrestling matches and it seems to me like the complimentary piece to dynamite is something more in the interview format with maybe one high profile match. Maybe you have uh, the equivalent of an intercontinental title match at the end of that show, but for the hour of the show, it's interviews and different people coming in and talking to Tony Schiavone and talking to Jim Ross and other people like a prime time. Yes, exactly. I, I, I could, I could dig that. I, and I think Tony and, uh, It'll also give Dasha something to do since Dasha Gonzalez, uh, formerly Fuentes, just kind of, she just kind of stands there <laughs> during during dark, and 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 Tony throws it to her occasionally, and she goes, "I'm very excited," and then throws it back to Tony. <laughs> uh, yeah, Taz has signed with AEW as an announcer. He'd be good wouldn't on that type worst, of format too. Wouldn't be the worst choice to have Tony and uh, Taz as as a duo or. Excalibur and Taz have done really great work together. Yeah, no, that's uh, you know, you'd have Joey Styles and Taz if you want to. I don't know if Joey's ever going to be coming back though after uh, what happened with uh, Evolve. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some weird, weird going on in AEW. Billy Gunn's kid has signed a deal. Da- Diamond Dallas's page stepdaughter is now signed a deal. <laughs> that little um, segment on Dynamite where DDP is just nakedly advertising his DDP yoga in disguise of him getting ready for a match, but it's just him like making sure the armbands are in camera frame and then doing, you know, his diamond downward facing dog or whatever. Look, I, you can, you all can mock DDP as a relentless shill. I get that. No, dude, I actually kind of admire that about him though. Watching him at 63 in the shape he was in work a match. Yeah. And also jump off the top turnbuckle down to the floor when he has no business doing something like that at his age. Mad respect for him. I love the guy. Dude, the I, program I used to be clearly has him. worked and helped transform his body and keep him in fantastic shape into his 60s. Like, he is a walking I, advertisement for the thing that he's doing. Yeah, DDP has, has traveled the gamut with me because I loved him in the AWA. He came to WCW as a manager. I thought he was okay. When he became a wrestler, I found him a bit overbearing. And now in his twilight, I love him again. Um, yeah. Uh, AEW, better show, I thought, this week. Again, the women's division is... is, is when you're just, saying better, are you saying compared to NXT, or are you just saying improved from where it was last compared week? On its, uh, compared on its... Okay, okay, I, sure. Yeah. Uh, compared to NXT... Um, I thought NXT was the stronger show of the two. I thought NXT was a strong. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I just especially the Horseman vibe that you got with the undisputed era beating down Keith Lee and just the undisputed versus Imperium angle. Like that has me kind of more locked in than anything that's going on in AEW presently. Yeah, no. I the only thing that really has me must watch every week on AEW is. If Cody comes out to cut a promo, because I think I, I still like his promos quite a bit. They're interesting. Um, he's doing he's yeah. doing. I don't always love them, but he's doing an interesting thing. <laughs> yeah, I uh, 
I, I'm 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 I've lost interest in a lot of other things like the butcher and the blade. Butcher and the blade and the bunny boring. Either. MJF has kind of cooled down as an intriguing thing. He doesn't say all that much. No. He um, and I guess also having reviewed EC three at peak EC three, my mind immediately goes to comping those two. And I find him lacking on all fronts compared to EC3 when EC3 was at his peak in like 2013. Well, the big the big controversy this week was between people comparing the two tag matches that opened the shows, between the uh, the tag match between Best Friends, um, uh, Hangman and 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 Omega, and uh, the the. Uh, let LA, I still call them LAX, but proud and powerful. And then I guess, uh, were private party in there too, or was it just a three way? Um, yeah, private party was in there. It's, it's not on a little, and then, and then between, yeah, yeah, no, they were definitely in that match for sure. And then Andrew, Andrews and Haskins versus, uh, or Andrews and Webster versus, uh, uh Dunn and Riddle, Dunn and Riddle. And, 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 you know, certain pundits saying, well, you can't, you can't trash one and call the other one good because they're, pretty much the same style and the same this and the same that. And I don't know. There were more stakes for the one on NXT for me because it, it was a tournament. So maybe that's just fake, but also just the story between two teams is much easier to tell for me than between two guys on one team in the midst of a four way, which is what they're doing with Omega and page. Yeah. So I, I don't l- love the comparison. I think that the one tag team versus the other tag team is always going to have the advantage because you'd see this on AEW, but you would see this on WWE or ring of honor or evolve. Whenever you have these multi team tag matches, what ends up happening is it's our turn, your turn, their turn, their turn. And, and everyone gets their shit in. And the thing that made the Riddle and Dunn and Webster's and Andrews match fun is in part, they just didn't have the time to prepare for it. So there was a lot of, there was a lot less get your shit in. There was lots of flipping. And I I think obviously that's going to be the point of comparison. And if you're going to bring that up, that's true. But um, I, I just, for my taste, I felt like, Dunn and Riddle and Webster's and Andrews fell. The problem was that I knew that Webster's and Andrews were not going to prevail. Um, but other than that, it just it felt much more like a tag team match. Whereas this, you had the four teams, and then you also had this like cloud of Hangman Page and Kenny Omega, and they become the point of emphasis. So in this sense, they are similar in that there's something else going on here that is distracting us from the outcome of the match. Um, and in this case, you're more focused on what's going on with Hangman Page and Kenny Omega, and how does that interplay with the Bucks? And I, I actually find all of their interactions to be weird is really the best way to put it. Like, they linger for too long, and nothing happens. NXT UK this week was basically a recap of Blackpool, so we'll go through Blackpool as as we go along here. Um, recap show, a lot of interviews. Um, the two matches on there, Joseph Connor beating A-Kid, which is... They really like Joseph Connor. I, it is dumbfounded, because I didn't mention this earlier, but y- you look at the NXT UK roster, and the fundamentals of this roster are really so- strong. You've got great baby faces like Trent Seven and Tyler Bate. Trent can talk. Bate's a great wrestler. You've got Zach Gibson, who you, know, you and I are super high on as a elite-level promo. You've got Walter, and for whatever reason... The guy with the pencil right now is like, no, 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 Joseph Connors. We need to be doing something with this guy. And the other match was Dave Mastiff and Cassius Ono with Ono basically, Ono doing a lot of yelling and comedy in there. It wasn't the Haas match I wanted it to be. It was very, you know, the one power move ended up pinning Ono in the match, and that was and for Mastiff to win. I was a little underwhelmed by it. I was hoping for, you know, Vader versus Bigelow or something. And I got, uh, I got a lot of arm bars and knuckle locks for Tessa's strength. <laughs> well, remember Ono was teasing that he was now going to be the wrestling, yeah, genius. wrestling yeah. genius and really show that. And I would have been fine with that after this match, 
But yes. leading into this match, I I had kind of forgotten that that was part of the narrative backdrop there, and I was kind of hoping that WWE would do the thing they usually do that we criticize them for and forget about it. I will say though, the interviews were okay; they weren't too bad. But I'll tell you who is really, really grown on me and really good is this Alicia Taylor, who is the uh, she she's the ring announcer for NXT US. Um, but she also will fly across. I guess I guess they've either gotten rid of Radsey or they want to have two announcers on each show because they kind of added another woman on uh, SmackDown this week. She give she has the best expressions. Like if like she she interviewed Gallus after they won the tag titles, and Gallus is like, "This is ours. We're gonna go celebrate." And she's like, "Yeah, we're gonna go have some fun." She she's just totally into it. And then she's talking to Tony Storm, who is basically threatening Rhea Ripley because something was ta- stolen from her, so she's going to steal something from Ripley back. And she is absolutely freaked out by what Tony Storm told her. If for nothing else, go back and watch NXT UK, the, the interview segments, and just watch Alicia Taylor on this. I I adore her. She is great. Uh, so as, as for the card, what do you think of uh, Blackpool 2? I thought it was good, not great. I agree. Yeah. Um, I mean, the big tag match at the end left me a little cold here. Um, Walter and Joe Coffey, I kind of liked. Like, like, I'm not going to lie. I, I just, but I, like, I'm really, I'm into Joe Coffey. I, I think that Joe Coffey is fun. But, but then at the end of Walter and Joe Coffey, we get into the overbooking finish and that lost me. So, like, the match itself was good. Um, up until Ilya Dragunov pops in. And, and then at that point, I'm kind of, eh. And I liked Bait and Devlin, but then they got into that weird little little man boxing match thing. And, and I'm just, here's the thing with fisticuffs, man. Like, the whole reason the punch is illegal in wrestling is that if you actually got punched in the face, you're going to go to the ground after two or three of them. Or these guys are punching like stormtroopers fire blasters. Okay, I I liked Bait and Devlin a little bit more than you did. I think I think that was. I mean, I thought I thought that was my match of the night. I yeah, really... that's probably the match of the night. But but that's kind of my point is that even the match of the night is not without problems. Coffee, I'll tell you the thing, and we we harped on this when they when they turned Gallus a bit because they really didn't turn them. They they just happened to be the baby faces in this certain situation. I would have loved Joe Coffey high-fiving fans and firing people up as opposed to just going in as badass Joe Coffey here. I, I, th- I think that's what was the missing aspect of this is because I need to be able to root for Joe Coffey to beat Walter. Yes, and I just claiming and- the kingdom, and he wants everyone to be invested in the project of him reclaiming the kingdom. And Gallus had just won the tag titles. So maybe have them come out high five. Hey man, I'm going to win this and we're going to reclaim our kingdom. Just something to have me get behind him as, as even if it's not real, a fiery baby face, Joe Coffey. Cause I need to buy into the idea that he might be able to beat Walter. If I'm going to watch him and Walter go at it for 25 minutes and that I want him to win. Yes. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I did. I want it to look like he's really kind of on the edge of doing so too. Yeah, I I uh I I'll go to the women's match. I liked the women's match a lot. I think Kaylee Ray is fantastic as a heel. She's just so good. Um the the interplay between her and Piper and then her and Tony were so great and doing it when she was obviously banged up and she took some brutal hits in this match too. That's another one. I have absolutely turned the corner on from the first time I ever saw her. I really, I I just like her a lot. I liked this story. Um, and I thought the right person won. I I do. I don't, I I was wrong in thinking that building up a title versus title match would have been a good thing. I think Tony without the title and still going into her darkness where I think, I think you could still build on that a little bit more. You could still have her go after Rhea Ripley at some point. Well, she's going after Rhea Ripley in two weeks. I know. I thought. So, oh, I thought she was only going to do that if she was the champion. 
I thought so too. Oh, but no, but that I, match was fixed and set in stone. It could have potentially been champion versus correct. Champion. Okay, correct. All right. And I, th- I think, I think she loses to Rhea, and then full dark side happens, and she basically becomes the Io Shirai of NXT UK, which you know, Io Shirai is still cheered, even though <laughs> even though she's cray cray and screaming and. Doing the crying eyes. I feel and like, like NXT that, US so. is sort of in on that though at this point, and that's yeah. that's why they yeah, juxtaposed they her to Bianca here at the end. And then the tag team match for me, I, I think it was our friend uh, Trevor, the Irish wrestling fan, who who likened it to a obstacle course on one of those game shows type. Yeah, things. a little bit Nickelodeon guts, absolutely. L- little Legend of the Hidden Temple. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm a fan of these of sorts of things. I know. Um, yeah, I just it, it, I'm I'm done with the multi-team tag team match where it's like, oh, I got to pretend I got to crawl up this a ladder. A ladder match is interesting enough with four people, right? Yes. Yeah, like you have two teams. There's a ladder. They have other things on the outside that they can use. I don't understand why we need ten people in this match. Because there are dumb things you do in these matches. That that the normal person will be watching going that makes it like if two people are climbing a ladder why are you putting ladders next to them to then climb yeah up right next why to wouldn't them? you just pull them off of the ladder exactly I just I can't get into throw these a ladder I, at the ladder I appreciate them for these stunt show at a theme park things that they are um you know the, the one in New Orleans for the U S title in NXT was insane but at the same time I'm just like. The, the more they do incredible stunts, the more I want them to simplify it and just make it about the belts. And, and I think that's where my disconnect is coming as a, as an old school wrestling fan who wants to like modern wrestling and is finding himself drifting away further and further. Yeah. The, the stipulations are not lending themselves to the storytelling. I just, I think there's enough going on with a tornado tag match that the teams can utilize a ladder and other weapons to get the belts to win the match. Like, I, I don't, I don't know why we need to add additional spice on top of that. It, it seems like overkill to me. And like this match very much suffered from that. I love all of these teams. I love the Grizzle Young Veterans. I love Imperium. The Grizzle Young Veterans versus Imperium would have been fun. Um, Gallus versus the Grizzle Young Veterans would have been fun. Gallus versus Imperium would have been fun. Um, less so with uh, Mark Andrews, Morgan Webster, only because they're a cold act. They're a great, they're a great team. But yeah, I just I don't need this. Um, you are gonna try to just gloss over the dragon, Eddie the Dragon Dennis, oh, and I'm not I'm not gonna let death. you over over gloss over my friend Eddie the dragon. Dennis. <laughs> Eddie Dennis. After weeks and months, and maybe even like a year of us mocking his gear, <sighs> comes out as Mortis. <laughs> Mortis was a skeleton. This is a dragon. This is a dragon. Not um, a skeleton. I didn't mind this match. I gotta be honest with you. I didn't mind it. Um, I didn't mind it. it and I, I mean, it's an improvement on Eddie Dennis's is. gear or whatever. But it, I mean, the the dragon mask looked pretty silly. Eddie Dennis's positives to me were always being on the microphone yes. and relating and relating wrestling to his backstory about being a headmaster. I think him the in a suit thing- as well. And this is, I think, been yes. our frustration is that the guy looks good in a suit. He looks like someone who can carry prestige and gravitas. And so when we'd see him dressed up like he was getting ready to play center in your rec league or when he's dressed up like a dragon, um, I think that it works against the things that Eddie Dennis brings to the ring that he can totally utilize. <laughs> I have the name for this episode already. Um, <laughs> it's going to be into the dragon. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. It, you want, I want, I want that to match. I think, I think the prestige thing you you've nailed it and you want him to come out in wrestling gear that he's a prestigious guy. I don't, you know, I don't need necessarily the Nick Aldis or Bobby Roode long flowing robe necessarily, but just that, you know, he, he's not some blue collar working stiff. 
that he is a man of education and, and refinement. A dragon just didn't match. For it doesn't me. I, match I the didn't music, understand it. Right? Yeah, yeah. Like the music felt like a non sequitur to the outfit. And it's always felt like a non sequitur to the outfit. The, like the things that Dennis has are not being utilized. And I, I'd argue that there's just been no co- coherent vision for this guy. They're not looking at the guy's positives and going, okay, how do we play up these positives to make this character a richer character? They're going with, well, what's his hook? What, what can we do on this thing to make him more showy? Let's dress him up as a dragon. He should hate Trent Seven because Trent Seven is vivacious. Like, the thing that he should he dislike about him is that Trent Seven's charismatic. And it sits or in that, contrast to his austere nature. That, or I'll give you, I'll give you another angle for him. He doesn't like Trent because Trent looks like he doesn't work hard yeah. for any of it. And he had to sacrifice everything to come in and be a wrestler. He had to sacrifice his job. Well, this and is the, the Frank don't Grimes love Homer him. Simpson thing, essentially. Yes. Yes. Look at you. You know, you're you don't shave your body. Yeah. You're a little out of shape. The people love you because you twirl your mustache a little bit. I had to give up my job that was well paying at a school. I'm to be laughed at by people who think I dress in a rec league. To, <laughs> you know, just all that. Stuff. Some idiot out in Texas calls me a dragon. Some idiot calls me a dragon. Some other loser in California who never made in show business. You know, thinks that thinks that I'm a spaz at times. You know, just anything you want, and have him build on that. But but it's just like, yeah, man, or even if it's just the love of the people, if you're gonna fight about that, because I don't mind that as a, as a story, because God knows we have Drew McIntyre coming out and his goofy ass thing again, doing his thing on Raw. You know, you you can the fight shtick. for the shtick is so weird with Drew McIntyre. <laughs> I know that's a non sequitur and we're starting to wrap up, but it was just something on my notes. I looked at it and went, oh yeah, I never brought up that in the six, six man and you're or the three way. And you're just like, what a weirdo. But yeah, no, Eddie Dennis should be going, look, this is a passion for me because I've given up everything in my life to pursue it. And you're just out here twirling your mustache and they cheer for you. I don't get it. I don't get why I've yeah you're exact the Frank Grimes thing. And There's an episode of The Simpsons where Homer is working at the nuclear plant, and I think it's called Homer's Rival. I think it's called Homer's. Rival. Yeah, yeah. And so there's this other guy at the plant, Frank Grimes, who is a little bit younger, full head of hair, skinny, works hard, but is less likable than Homer. And kind of like the the moral of the story. I mean, there's twists and turns. It's The Simpsons or whatever. But like the underlying fundamentals of the story is that you can be all of those virtuous traits hardworking, studious show up to work on time clean all those things and still be not likable and homer simpson is none of those things he's not even any good at his job but people just like the guy and there's something to be said for just being someone that people like it's called homer's enemy it is the 23rd episode of season eight if you have disney plus Go watch it. It's a hilarious episode. I love it. <laughs> uh, so that'll do it for us this week. Uh, you can follow me at Crap Game 13. You can follow Chris at Chris Novembre. You can follow the show at Shake Them Ropes. Chris, announcements, show plugs, anything you'd like to do at this time. Don't Worry About the Government is my other podcast. You can find that over at Don'tWorry.tv. I'm on Twitter at C-H-R-I-S-N-O-V-E-M-B-R-I-N-O. I have another show called the All in the Family Podcast. We're on hiatus right now, but you can listen to all of those shows archivally. There's a lot of them. They're sort of evergreen, so you can really listen to them whenever you want if you want some more content. Now, as for the big announcement, perhaps you can tell by the tone of my voice it's not going to be a positive one. But at WrestleMania, I will be finishing up my time here at Voices of Wrestling. I have been very fortunate in seeing this site grow from basically nothing and being the second podcast 
on a fledgling startup wrestling website that focused primarily on Japanese wrestling. Pretty esoteric shit. And Rich and Joe were nice enough to have a guy on who had nothing on his wrestling resume at that point. Just had hosted a bunch of podcasts and said that he would do them and put them in on a regular basis and they'd sound relatively good. And with that very flimsy promise, my career here on Voices of Wrestling began. And since then, in 2013, I got a chance to close caption professional wrestling. And I closed captioned a bunch of professional wrestling. So I actually ended up getting to do something in my own career that had something to do with wrestling. I got to do all these podcasts in this really awesome freeform way for the better part of a decade here from 2013 onwards. And I'm eternally grateful for that. And that's, that was a really, really exciting time of my life. However, I'm now at a stage in my life where I'm just feeling really strapped for time these days. The, the job is different now. The job does not give me the freedom and flexibility to edit shows while I'm working, which was a thing that maybe was not necessarily looked on upon with fondness, but was also time permitting. This is simply not something I can do at this job that I'm doing now. I'm doing Don't Worry About the Government, and Don't Worry About the Government's doing better numbers, and I need to grow out that show. And also, and, and this is a factor in this, I, like, I'm not going to lie, like, this it seems petty, but it, when you stack it in, it was a deciding point. WWE moving SmackDown to Fridays means that I have to tape this thing on Saturday and then plan the rest of the weekend around taping this wrestling show for a product in World Wrestling Entertainment that, while it was exciting to close caption, frankly, is not all that exciting to watch on a large scale. Like, I wouldn't watch the main roster if I wasn't having to review it right now. I wouldn't watch on Fridays, and I wouldn't watch on Mondays. I'd get my fix in the middle of the week here, probably watching NXT, watching maybe NXT UK a little bit, maybe catch AEW and even the occasional episode of NWA Power in the middle of the week here, but that is so much closer to what I want out of my professional wrestling, and I don't want to do a hate watch podcast. So I feel like Shake Them Ropes was turning into that for me, and I've been giving it some thought over the last several months. Shut up, Chesterfield. He's not going to shut up, and I apologize for that. This is supposed to be an emotional moment. This is, you're ruining an emotional moment, Chesterfield, again, as always. But for me, at this stage, it's time to take a break from doing WWE coverage. I will probably still, in some way, shape, or form, keep the Shake Them Ropes Patreon open. And actually, more than likely, like I'll discuss this in the coming weeks here, because I'm not wrapping up until WrestleMania. We'll figure out what the kind of remaining vestigial nove doing wrestling stuff will be but maybe once a month i slide into that patreon there and we talk about bring back high wattage i mean who doesn't love high wattage pretty much everyone no one seemed to really like high wattage and in addition to high wattage maybe we go back to watching some archival wcw some archival all japan some archival new japan from the 90s we'll go on an early 90s kick and Watch some of the wrestling that I really was into back in the day. But I want to have that joy of pacing around my living room thing that Lanza talked about all those years ago. And I have not had that in a long time. I want to just say real quickly to the people who have listened to my shows over here and have come and check out Don't Worry About the Government. I'm really grateful to you guys. You guys were actually the people I was thinking about the most when I was considering how long I was going to do this. I probably hung in doing this an extra six months just because y'all. So um, I I hope you maybe remember that when I say goodbye here in April or whenever the hell WrestleMania is. But that's going to do it. Uh, That's that's enough sentimentality and sappiness. 
Hawkins is gone because we botched the first take of this. Like Chesterfield won't shut up now, but like earlier people were calling my phone and it it was kind of funny. Like initially I, I would have kept it in because I kind of like botch radio, but it really ruined it. And I want this to be like a little bit better and a little bit more holistic, but now it's just going long and the guitar solo is starting to play and it's going to sound wistful, but I can't really fix that. It's just going to be wistful now. <laughs>